our brain doesn't really differentiate between work and non-work. Suppose you have to work for 50 hours, but the remaining time you're scrolling on Twitter, which you think is rest, you think is your personal time, but Twitter is full of say hate comments. Even two hours of that is more harmful than my friend, Dr. Sid Warrior, a practicing neurologist in Mumbai and also very active in social media talking about mental health issues. In new practice, are you seeing teenage, you know, like depression, anxiety, yeah. slightly more? Yeah, definitely. Stress is the common factor. Stress can lead to stress eating, which can lead to obesity. But stress can also lead to anxiety and depression. Somebody who has obesity because of stress could also have a mental health problem. It's like this web of interconnected things. I'm going to ask a controversial question. If you pay attention, our brain keeps coming up with excuses to not do something and that's the limbic testing you. I'm sitting with you, Correct. you have a drink in your hand, I don't have a drink in my hand. My brain is saying, oh, why am I not part of this culture? Our brain plays these tricks on us. The day Big Boss stops being popular is when human beings evolve. Why do you say that? The only reason Big Boss is popular is because I'm so excited. <laughs> Me too. Because uh, I always wanted to be a neurologist. Oh. Uh, because the function that the brain can do, yeah. I think gut can do as well. It actually can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a masterpiece, right? Uh, gut is, uh, brain is a masterpiece. Yeah. Right off the bat, I wanted to ask you that there has been increasing mental health issues yes. uh, in the last couple of uh, years, especially yeah. after COVID. Yeah. And uh, I have seen your videos in the past and you said whenever there's a mental health issue, just rant about it. <laughs> so I want you to rant about <laughs> why mental health issues are on the rise in yeah. the last couple of years. Yeah, ranting is great. I would recommend it to everyone. Uh, the ranting has got a bad name, but that's more because people who are being ranted to don't know what to do with this information. But it's great for the ranter. <laughs> so I would definitely recommend ranting. Um, my so, rant so ranting on, can be done without anybody else? Will? It actually can. Yeah. Yes, which is what journaling is. Yeah. Because the more you rant, what you are doing is you are giving emotions words. So you are giving... So emotions are very chaotic things. It's like a cloud. There is no structure. They're just feelings, you know. But when you give them words, they suddenly start taking shape. And the more shape you give, the more your brain has control over them now. So in a way, ranting is a way for your brain to get, get control over chaotic emotions. So the more you rant, the calmer you will feel. Uh, so I would say rant, rant. it helps. Uh. The reason that mental health issues are rising, there are, I, I feel there are two reasons. One is greater awareness. So a lot of these mental health issues earlier would not be diagnosed or they wouldn't be called as mental health problems. But now we know that it is an issue. So the awareness is increasing, the diagnosis is increasing. But on the other hand, our lifestyles are also changing. So now there is more stress on our nervous system. There is more anxiety. There is more things that our nervous system has to deal with. So both of these things put together is causing mental health problems to rise. True. Right. Yeah. So in your practice, you're seeing which age group, you know, like 20 to 30 or like 40 to 50? Um, so I'm actually seeing all age groups, but the kind of problems that they come with are different. So kids would have more of developmental problems. So there's something genetic, uh, you know, there's some hormonal problems at that age. You're talking about less than 20. Less, less than, than 10. 10. Less than 10. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. So for example, cerebral palsy or seizures. So less than 10 years old, that is the issue. The kid is not able to walk. The kid is not speaking properly, that kind of patients. Uh, around teenagers, like so 18 to 30, most of them will have some kind of um, spectrum problem of mental health and physical pain. So I call this a emotional physical pain spectrum. So that could be anxiety, sleep problems, migraine, back pain, neck pain. All of this is on that spectrum of the body and mind not able to deal with the stresses of life. Migraine can be a yes. simple. Yes. So migraine is also part of that pain spectrum. And then once you've crossed 40-50, then you have problems of age. So now your brain is slowing down. You start having forgetfulness. You're not able to think so clearly. And you can have early onset Alzheimer's. Some of them have Parkinson. They're unable to walk properly. So that is the spectrum. All this starts at 40 itself. Yes. So 40, 50 is when it can start. But the symptoms are very mild. They usually get caught 
much later thank you so much i just turned 40 <laughs> You look fine, doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I think with the YouTube, I think I'll slowly it'll come. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll give you my clinic address. <laughs> <laughs> wow, early on at forty, forty yes. dementia, huh? Yes, ah, yes. So ah. some patients do come at forty, forty-five with early onset Alzheimer's. Early onset Alzheimer's. Yes, ah. yes. So Alzheimer's is for the audience, you know, just a most common cause of memory loss. Yes, it is the most common cause of dementia. and early onset alzheimers usually has a genetic cause so their family history will be strong so if anyone in your family or uh, your grandfather grandmother has started having memory loss at the age of 40 50 then it's better to go to a neurologist and get it checked out even without any symptoms or no if you have if you are having symptoms and how do we usually the spouse or the close family members will notice correct Yes, they are the first ones to notice ah. because initially they will think, "Oh, you're just being forgetful." Correct. Right? You forget a birthday, uh, which is completely fine. But then you start forgetting more important things. You'll start forgetting what you're supposed to do today. You start forgetting somebody's name. You start forgetting your own phone number. That is when they start thinking, "Oh, this is not just work stress. Something is actually wrong." Then they will come to a neurologist. No, tell me an interesting patient that you have seen. Mm -hmm. That which is a different uh, pre presentation at the age of forty, uh -huh. like small small things that you picked up in your practice. So um, one interesting patient was um, it was a fifty five year old. He used to be in the merchant navy, okay, and then he left merchant navy at the age of forty, and since then he's been working as a businessman in Bombay. Now at the age of fifty five, he started having dementia, and he had a, a slightly rare kind of dementia. um wherein he started forgetting about time huh so he started getting confused about what time it is and what year it is and he started thinking that he was actually in 1990 huh. so his mind went back to the time when he was still in the merchant navy and he was only 55 he was 55 and he used to think that now i'm 35 so he would start behaving like that he would he would get up and say that tomorrow i have my ship is leaving and he would pack his bags and he would say that i have to go and what was uh causing the family problems was that he would expect his wife to be as involved with him physically as they were back in the day and now they have kids and the kids are grown up and one of the kid is married and now his wife has not been in that state of mind and this man is thinking that i am a 30 year old and why is my wife not finding me attractive so that was the complaint that they came with wow so brain problems can there there are maybe two three things that can go wrong but there are a hundred things that they can come to you with with exactly right the presentation might be very varied that is what makes it both challenging exciting as well yes exciting as well yes. i mean alzheimer's dementia it has been a while since i have uh, seen a neurological patient yeah. but based on what i know is uh, it's a deposition of amyloid it's a protein correct. deposit correct in the cells of the brain yes tau proteins ah. get deposited ah. and uh, there is something called neurofibrillary tangles so ah. that's when uh, those amyloids uh, get caught up on top of each other correct. so it's literally like clutter clutter ah. in your brain correct like uh, a trash can like a trash can uh, so over a period of time that deposition becomes too much uh, so there's too much kachra kachra uh, and now your brain stops working in that way and you have seen patients with early uh, 40 45 as well yes uh, yes but of course it's very important to check if is this alzheimers or is this something, something else, else. Uh, sometimes there are other diseases like prion diseases uh, you know creutzfeldt jakob disease that can also present early on but then it's not alzheimers it is something else It, let's say you know I'm asking for myself. <laughs> so let's say I'm forty. Uh -huh. uh, okay, I want to prevent Alzheimer's. Hmm. Correct. Yeah. And uh, any steps that I can take? Absolutely yes. Uh -huh. um, so even if there is a genetic background, mm -hmm. it is always you always have to remember that genetic is just one part of it. Mm. You can never blame only genetics mm. because environment makes a difference. Correct. So, for example, I'll use an example from your field, doctor. Yeah, yeah. There was oh, use me as a patient. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. But <laughs> uh, I would use a example of someone, uh, of a friend of mine. His father recently passed away with uh, liver cancer. Now, his I I asked them when when they were diagnosed, and it was a very brief diagnosis. So he was diagnosed, and he passed away within three four weeks, and he was seventy years old. 
and when i asked their history that father's father grandfather and his two elder brothers all passed away with liver cancer at the age of 60 to 64 so clearly there's a very strong history hereditary, huh? hereditary history of mm. liver cancer mm. but my friend's dad lived up to 70 mm. and i asked him what kind of lifestyle he led and i've never heard of a man living more of a disciplined life so he never touched alcohol he was no smoking very clean habits wake up on time sleep on time meditate every day yoga he would spend every morning wake up and write he would journal he would take long walks with his wife every morning he would have a very close family system so overall his body was very healthy which is i believe what made the difference and gave him an extra 10 years so from 60 to 70 he was able to live a good life because of his lifestyle now suppose if he was also drinking smoking if he had a bad lifestyle i believe he would have had these symptoms even earlier so genetics is one reason but your lifestyle makes a big difference you can compensate for that compensate for that so alzheimers at 50 and alzheimers at 70 is a big difference because you get 20 more more years of good life so that is why lifestyle makes a difference yeah See, when i say lifestyle is main thing is according to me is sleep sleep is the most important thing because when we say kachra in the brain the trash in the brain sleep is when that trash gets taken out so there is this drainage system called as the glymphatic system mm. in the brain mm. that is the sewage system sewage system it so takes all the trash out all the trash out mm. it gets activated in sleep mm. so no sleep the trash gets accumulated mm. Mm. so over a period of time that is what causes most damage and the second thing is stress mm. uh inflammation to be specific mm. so anything that increases inflammation in your body increases the chances of alzheimer's alzheimer's correct yes so the first part sleep is the one thing yes that we dog we doctors don't get unfortunately <laughs> yes no i will think about all the uh, night duties that we did correct huh? absolutely and all this uh, people uh, especially in us mm-hmm. i see um all this uh, big software companies correct yes and the majority of their employees are in india yes and their work hours is 8 am to 5 pm correct here is 10 pm to 6 am graveyard shift it's a it's a very uh, it's a very serious problem dangerous problem yes dangerous problem yes. multiple studies as you know that it says that night shift workers are increased risk of obesity diabetes yes. and hypertension yes heart disease heart it, disease is a big issue yes i just want to know from a neurological standpoint how long how much is too much okay a young guy joins graduates in a does all the good work uh passes in high flying colors gets in amazon yeah okay online it's a wonderful thing to get in amazon it's not easy yeah. then they get a handful of uh, handsome amount of money yeah and then uh, their life is settled that's what they think correct so they start doing this night shift around 20 yeah. to 23 years of age and based on what i have seen since the my youtube channel is that many people have been doing this for the last 15 16 years yes So is there a timeline that okay no more than 5 years if you do this the risk goes up or more than 10 years what is your i know there's no big research on that but yeah. your thought process the the thing is that our body can get used to anything so our body has a reserve so till this point there's not a lot of harm done because our body can recover from it the problem is that the pace of recovery slows down so you can take more risks with your body when you're 20 which you cannot take at the age of 30 which would you definitely should not take at the age of 40 and if you take it at 50 it can be harmful it can kill you that same risk right so going three sleepless nights at the age of 18 versus at the age of 60 big difference so i have seen patients of parkinson or alzheimers who are doing well mm. they're taking medicines mm. they have one sleepless night mm. say they're traveling by train huh. and they were not able to sleep the next day they crash so that is how powerful sleep is and the amount of reserve you have so i wouldn't say that this is the time limit but if you have to work hard at the age of 20 work hard so that after 25 you can start slowing down and shift to a more sustainable lifestyle so that's what i tell students also a lot of students are used to studying at night they call themselves night owls fine I don't want to interfere with your studies you study at night but don't think that this is the lifestyle that you should sustain for the rest of your life so by the time you're closer to 30 change that definition in your head 
Don't call yourself night owls anymore. Switch because your body is switching. So it's okay to say that I used to enjoy staying up, but now I don't. And that is something that happens naturally also. But you should also try to make that change. And people say that you know, oh, I have, uh, I, I'm being, I'm getting aged because I'm not able to wake up at uh, night. Yeah, I'm not doing night owls anymore. It's yeah. meant to be a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> Listen to your body. Yeah, it's a good thing. <laughs> it is telling you. <laughs> and you know, people feel socially pressured where yeah. you know they cannot uh, extend the night for a long time. <laughs> yeah, 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 correct. But that's so silly um, because uh, your body is trying to tell you something. Uh-huh. It's absolutely okay to grow up. Okay to grow up. Uh-huh. Yeah, you should grow up gracefully, not uh, screaming and protesting. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, us doctors, yeah, correct, and uh, we don't have a choice. Mm. Uh, you know, even at 30, we yeah. do the exact same thing. I have a strong feeling. I'll, I think I have a strong feeling where you we see a lot of young deaths among doctors per se. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. And uh, we are seeing a young heart attacks in throughout India. Yeah. Uh, increased risk compared to other world yeah. part of the, parts of the world. Yeah. I have a strong feeling that it is tied to sleep. Absolutely. In the medical community, it's there is a glorification of work beyond time. That, um, you know, the doctors are available 24-7. They will always be there. And I understand that, of course, as the people responsible for the health of the country, you should be available. But uh, we should also be aware that what this is doing to you. So there should be a maybe a rotation system where if you spend one week on night calls, then the remaining three weeks, you are able to sleep better. Because that also makes a difference. Whereas if there is a private practitioner who is available every day, 24-7, all throughout the year, the harm he is doing to himself or herself is much more than what they know. And it will come back. So it's, it's always better to take care of your own health so that you can serve the public longer rather than having to retire at 40. Right. And and the retirement at 40 is not going to happen. <laughs> that's, that's, not just happening. A, that's just a pipe dream. That's just a pipe dream. Yeah. yeah. It's not happening. It's the same thing with the engineering or any other occupation yeah. as well. Exactly. Where I think that they should just be aware that the abuse to the body is happening yeah. at some level. And then they should just revert back a little bit whenever there is a chance. Correct. It's the short burst versus the marathon run concept. Because what hustle culture says is, you go all in, you work, 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 don't think about anything else. And then you get your goal. But then the goals keep shifting and you keep having more and newer and newer goals. But if you are somebody who thinks long term, saying that it's okay if I'm not succeeding in two months, but I want to be successful in 20 years, your whole thought process changes. Now taking care of your health, taking care of your diet makes more sense. It becomes more important. That is the shift. If you're only concerned with short term gains, then it makes sense to have sleepless nights. But if you're planning for your long-term future, then taking care of your health makes much more sense. How about sleeping in the afternoon? They say they'll catch up. What is your thought process? Uh, So the problem is that people misunderstand the concept of sleep debt. You know, this is a famous term, sleep debt. That I've slept for three hours, then I'll sleep for three hours later. But they don't understand that what uninterrupted sleep does is very different. So it's not about just giving back 200 rupees. Uh, It's about having that uninterrupted time so that your brain can go up to that REM stage, come back to NREM, and you need four such cycles of NREM followed by REM for a good recovery of sleep. All these stages of sleep where you go to deep sleep. Yes. Mm. So ideally, you should have around four cycles. And each cycle takes approximately 90 minutes. So one stage, as you go from awake to sleep, your brain waves keep slowing down. So you're going deeper and deeper into rest. So you first go through a stage of NREM, which is non-rapid eye movement. And then you go through a stage of REM, which is rapid eye movement. That's when your eyes flutter. And then you come back to NREM. And then you go back to REM. This cycle is what sleep is. And you have to go through four such cycles minimum. 
for a good sleep so comes to 6, six to 7 hours, hours. Mm. yes yeah, 6 mm. hours is minimum, minimum 8 hours is ideal ideal yes. and then when you are doing only 3 4 hours this cycle you're not going through correct and then when you are sleeping in the afternoon again the same thing the cycle is not being completed correct okay. and people who will who keep waking up also will not complete the cycle adequately so that is why it's very important to see if do you wake up multiple times at night so things like obstructive sleep apnea for example one of the most under diagnosed condition disturbs your sleep and you won't even know it you might not even know that you're waking up and going back to sleep so these things make a big difference can you explain sleep apnea to the uh, audience please? of course huh. yes i think it's something that everyone should know about huh. traditionally it was associated with obesity so obesity and a thick neck means that when you're sleeping your trachea which is your wind pipe it gets compressed and you're not able to breathe properly but not enough that you're choking but just enough that your oxygen supply becomes less that's when you traditionally snore so sleep apnea is associated with snoring now throughout the night your oxygen levels go down and your brain activity suffers and over a period of time if you keep having these apnea episodes where you stop breathing your body suffers in multiple ways you get blood pressure you get hypertension so your blood pressure goes up you can have cardiac problems you can have anxiety you can have morning sleepiness because you haven't slept at night and over a period of time the chances of your heart attacks strokes all of these things go up and it's very important to check the only way you can check is by doing a sleep study so currently in my practice after my core test which is say a nerve conduction an mri sleep study is the third most common test that i prescribe very very important i actually i did a sleep study yeah ha ah, myself you know why i found that out i have a mild sleep apnea right ha ah, the reason i found that out was i felt extremely tired in the morning yeah even after 7 hours 8 hours of quality sleep yeah and uh, that is what you of, thought was quality ha ah, correct what i thought was quality yes. sleep and i was like you know so i thought it initially was night shift maybe it was yeah. too much work then i realized okay even on vacation yeah. uh this was happening so early daytime sleepiness yes is one of the most common symptom yes mm. yes Very like important. like you're feeling tired even after you have slept after you have slept mm. so you go to sleep at 11 you wake up at 7 you think that you've slept well you're having breakfast and you're sleepy ah. you're in a meeting and you're sleepy ah. if it becomes worse sometimes you sleep while driving which is very dangerous so obstructive sleep apnea in its severe form can be life threatening in itself and in its milder form can cause other problems other problems yes i have a feeling that you know um, because of the sleep deprivation or all mm-hmm. things the sleep apnea kicks in yeah uh, in terms of you know most common condition yeah uh, that decreases the oxygen level in the body mm-hmm. that strains the heart as you said yeah and i i still believe that that might be the initiating factor for all the heart disease that we are seeing yeah because we don't give the respect to sleep as much as it deserves as it should i know absolutely and nowadays things are changing people are appreciative that sleep is important but i don't think they understand how much how much ha huh? yeah and how in how many different parts of our life sleep affects so even memory loss there are a lot of young people coming to me with memory loss and it's very subjective memory loss maybe on the tests they are okay but subjectively they feel that i'm not able to remember i'm not able to focus i keep forgetting small small things very likely that their sleep is affected absolutely yeah. so for me if i sleep properly you're saying that alzheimer's dementia will be gone down the chances reduce so yes. i'll get it eventually huh <laughs> <laughs> you're very optimistic thank you so much <laughs> I'm happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my 40 plus, okay? Yeah. So how about this 20 to 30? Yeah. To be honest, I'm very concerned about them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I think this uh, social media is not helping. Okay. Yeah. And the uh, second step is uh, I really want to talk to you about is I know you have talked in the past as well on the social media addiction hmm. causing sleeplessness mental health issues and all those Correct. things one other problem that all my patients tell me is that you know they wake up in the middle of the night yeah and then you know they uh, use the restroom and then they come back and then finding it difficult to go back to sleep yeah uh, will that interfere with anything at all um so waking up to go to the washroom is absolutely okay um 
of course if you are waking up too many times so say more than twice mm-hmm. in a night you might have to get checked for other things so if you are a, a middle aged or a older man you should get your prostate checked out but that's a different issue because that can cause some what you call nocturia which is increased urination at night and that can disturb your sleep which has a you know waterfall effect you know so going down because of the there might be nothing wrong with your sleep per se but because of a urine problem your sleep is affected so that is one thing a reinitiation of sleep can be a problem as your age goes up so you might sleep but if somebody wakes you up then you might have trouble going back to sleep so that is an age issue you might have to see a sleep specialist for that and you might even need medication the other reason why you have trouble initiating sleep is because of anxiety so if you're stressed out about work if you have uh, you know if you're thinking about a lot of things you might have trouble calming down so that is a third thing people who consume alcohol there is a inverse relationship that you drink alcohol you can sleep but if you are a chronic then you might have trouble initiating sleep without alcohol so again that you might need to go through a de addiction program because alcohol really messes up with your nervous system but but even social drinking can interfere with the, your sleep correct? yes it depends on how often you do it and once your brain gets used to a certain chemical your brain cannot tell if this chemical is coming from inside or outside ah. that is the issue so all these drugs even alcohol or anything else does not actually do anything from outside they go into your brain and they affect the chemicals that are already there so for example alcohol affects this chemical called gaba now gaba is an inhibitory neurotransmitter it slows your brain down so our brain is thinking that for some reason my gaba receptors are more active and so i don't have to do anything now because it's automatically coming down and it gets used to this so when you take away the alcohol now our brain has kind of quote and quote forgotten how to activate gaba by itself and so now it needs alcohol to come and do the job it's like somebody who's always known how to drive and then they hire a driver and the driver has been driving for 10 years and suddenly they are told to drive for a minute they forget where how is the to, steering wheel where is the steering wheel <laughs> so somebody who's been drinking alcohol a lot that is the way it is that they forget how to how to go to sleep by yourself yeah. um, teach me here where you know i have seen many of my us patients every time i talk to them about you know not eating late at night they say oh i don't eat anything i just drink wine <laughs> you did you know this that every american household dinner yeah. always has wine has wine always has wine yeah and uh, they think that wine is relaxing them yeah and i tell them that you know wine is going to disturb your circadian rhythm yeah if it was you in an america will you drink wine <laughs> <laughs> there was that one study right that showed that wine is good for your yeah, heart yeah yeah resveratrol i cannot think of another study that has done more harm <laughs> to the world honestly that's um, it is because that study has been misinterpreted and taken so much out of context that oh one drink is okay one thing now there are two ways to look at it our brain can get used to anything and like i said at a younger age if you are giving it a particular amount of stress it can get used to it and it might not even do harm because if it there is enough reserve it can get used to it but the problem is that as you keep growing older and you increase the stress more it can do harm so similarly with alcohol at a younger age if you are drinking a little bit little bit little bit little bit our brain gets used to it and then you can have a nor almost normal life of course our liver problems are different okay but over a period of time that same amount can be can seem more and more to the brain because our brain's capacity is going down so i would yes i know that people go through a college phase they want to experiment they want to drink so the alcohol is just part of a larger exploration right our brain is curious it wants to experience new things and anyone who says don't do this they become part of the problem ah you want to do more so i have realized that the human behavior is such that don't say absolutely no to anything you are just egging them on but after they have done with that curiosity phase 
then is the time to teach them that, okay, now you're done with this. Now understand that this is the harm you've done to your brain. And do you want to keep doing this? And it's just like how they get exposed to alcohol at the teenage years. They should get exposed to alcohol awareness at their 25, 26 years of age. And the earlier they get exposed to this knowledge, the better. So human beings are not meant to drink alcohol by the age of 30, 35, 40. It should definitely slow down and stop. It can be a part of that exploratory phase, but then they should stop. Absolutely. And if somebody goes through life without that exploratory phase, even better. Even better. Yes. But sometimes the problem is the exploratory phase is very difficult to cut down, correct? Yeah. Uh, that's the that's the correct. hook over there. So the the solution is to find healthier things to explore. Like then, Sid Warrior Channel. Like Sid Warrior <laughs> Channel. <laughs> I have to say, Doc, you're very good at plugging things in. <laughs> I must learn this from you. <laughs> So you, you so you surround yourself with good things and yes. then you explore. There are lots of good things there to explore. There are so many things to explore uh -huh. in life. Uh -huh. But whatever comes easily to us, we will explore those things first. And the one thing that alcohol companies have done very well is uh, marketing. They have made it so easily available. Like for example, uh, rock climbing is a great thing to explore. But if I, if in living in Bombay, if I want to go rock climbing, I can't think of a single place. Nowhere. Where do, where, where do I go? But alcohol, there's a shop in every corner, you know. So healthier things are always more difficult to come across. Whereas um, harmful things are so easy. So easy. It's just so easy. everywhere. But, but you agree that even social drinking interferes with your sleep, correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, interferes with sleep. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so to start with, our life is like a lot of stress as well to start yeah. with. And then you're adding this, you're thinking that you're drinking alcohol to loosen us up. Yeah. And then that disturbs the sleep overnight. Yes. And that adds the stress in like there's a vicious cycle. Anyone who has woken up saying never again <laughs> <laughs> knows how much alcohol messes with your sleep. Because you wake up feeling completely messed up. Ah. Right? You feel horrible. And that is your brain recovering from what is essentially a big big punch that it has taken to the to itself. So drinking alcohol or binge drinking is like somebody punching your brain. It is reeling. It is uh, recovering from it. And slowly it is coming back to reality. Now imagine getting punched again and again every week. Of course, there will be some damage. right? So that is the problem. Binge drinking is of course extremely bad. Social drinking is less bad, but it is also bad. Not drinking is best. So everything in a spectrum... So if somebody is binge drinking, I would say, come back, come down to social drinking. Mm -hmm. And when somebody is in social drinking, I would say instead of three, take one. Mm -hmm. And if you're at one, then slow down, stop. Right. So there are these small tricks that one should use while weaning off. Mm -hmm. Because while it is good to say that you should be completely, you know, strong willpower, you should just quit. With people is difficult. So many times it is the social action that they crave. I'm sitting with you. You have a drink in your hand. I don't have a drink in my hand. My brain is saying, oh, why am I not part of this culture? Right? They may not even like the alcohol. They want to be part of it. So to such people, I would say that instead of 60 ml, you put 10 ml and you fill the rest with water and ice. Uh. You will still enjoy the night as much. It's not about the alcohol many times. Right? That's why I say do buttermilk. Yes, absolutely. But it has to look also, look. no? That's the thing. Correct. They don't want to seem like, oh, tum chas pi rahe ho. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. They want to look like they're drinking alcohol. <laughs> right? Which is why you, you've seen those kids who have those little candies that are shaped like cigarettes. Uh, 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 correct, correct, correct. Right. So uh, because they think, they look at uh, movies, they think, oh, this hero is so cool. And they pick up those candies that are shaped like cigarettes and they put it in their mouth and they think they're cool. Mm. Our brain plays these tricks on us. So if somebody's trying to quit alcohol, just cut down the quantity and enjoy your social gathering. You will have as much fun with your body taking a lot less damage, which is what we want at the end of the day. Right. Correct. I think uh, this alcohol consumption has become a part of the, uh, you know, the productive community. Yes. Uh, especially between 20 to 35. Okay. They work hard. They relax. They drink alcohol. Okay. At the same time, they are also very productive. 
yeah. that they are working you know like 40 50 hours a week Correct. and uh, we are having leaders in the field uh, saying that you should work even 70 hours a week yeah correct yeah and uh, when they say that uh, it's almost similar to like what we are going through in our training yeah so we used to do like 36 hour shifts and uh, yeah. everything correct right? and yeah. uh, so i personally feel like i have abused my body mm-hmm. because of that and i have had a health care and 5 uh, years ago okay uh, which was my wake up call oh and uh, when this person i mean when the uh, thought process is that you know you work more you become yeah. productive what is the fine line that they should do right you know yeah. what is the brain damage that will happen or they should be productive at this age similar to how you said you know 20 to 30 and then 30 after slow down do you have any thought process around that so here's the thing mm. our brain doesn't really differentiate between work and non work okay it only knows between work and rest we divide it saying that okay this is work this is hobby this is my personal time this is something i'm reading this is something for fun we make those classifications for our brain it is either work wherein it has to pay attention and create stuff or it is rest sympathetic and parasympathetic in the autonomic nervous system language these are the two states so if what you are doing actively doing is something that you quote unquote enjoy it's not really work okay so i would say that you can work as much as you want okay but if you are getting stressed about it if you are not enjoying it if it is not giving you pleasure if you are if your body is fighting against it even 2 hours of that is more harmful than spending 16 hours doing something you like because ultimately what difference is it to the brain if you are at home and you are arguing with your wife okay technically you are at home it's family time but you are arguing all the time your work is actually more is better for your brain so it's not really about the 70 hour work week it's about how stressed you are while doing that activity because for the brain it is just another activity the brain does not care you could get more stressed watching a bad netflix movie than having a good time at work with your friends so if you are getting along with your colleagues if the work that they're doing is stimulating if you're getting good validation if you're enjoying your work you it it identifies with you you feel like this is what i want to do in life you can work 100 hours a week it's fine but the more your body is in sympathetic that is in stressed zone that is when you suffer so the 70 hour work week is very arbitrary it assumes that the people don't enjoy work so for say narayan murthy 70 hours is nothing because it is his baby uh-huh. he will work all Even 90 hours absolutely uh-huh. and it is not going to harm him correct because it is him he that's what he wants to do with his energy and time uh-huh. the problem happens when what you actually want to do is something else and you're doing this against your will uh-huh. that is when you get stressed out that is the harmful time uh-huh. yeah i'm going to ask a controversial question okay 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 i think both of us can relate to this mm-hmm. okay not controversial just a uh, brainstorming sure. ideas okay so we are we are have a full time profession of doctors yeah okay and we also do this youtube thing yes okay and you're also very active yeah uh given an option between these two which one you will be in parasympathetic state <laughs> <laughs> let's have your hospital not watch the podcast yeah <laughs> No, I actually enjoy my time at the hospital. I I absolutely love it. In fact, I remember thinking that when I enter my OPD and that door shuts and I'm in my consulting room, I feel so peaceful because I know that for the next 4 hours, 5 hours, I don't have to pay attention to anything outside of this room. I am completely there and my entire world is just me and my patient. whoever calls me i can just say i'm in the hospital it is actually very peaceful because you're not conflicted you don't have to be anywhere else you know this is what you want to do when they come with a problem and you are able to help them is there any better feeling right and when they come back and say that whatever medicine you gave whatever advice you gave it helped them it is constantly calming 
of course there are stresses you know some patient who's very serious some patient who's not getting better those stresses are there but that's what we went through residency for so uh, i spent 3 years in kem hospital 3 years in lucknow sanjay gandhi hospital uh, and before that in mbbs i was in jj hospital i have been through government setups i have had all the stress that i could take and now i know how to handle stress i know how to handle this stress so i'm okay ha ah. youtube is different because youtube is a whole new kind new of stress ah. so for me youtube stress is actually more difficult to take because ah. i'm not used to it so i'm getting i'm getting used to it now so for me youtube is actually more work more work ha ah. because i'm trying to figure out how to do it and i'm sure everyone can relate to this there's some things that they're very good at and some things that they're learning ha ah. so like that, like me learning the podcast yes <laughs> and you're so good at it already <laughs> See the the consultation space is yeah. the space I absolutely love. Right. Because even when my wife says I say shh I'm in the consultation room. <laughs> no one will complain. No. <laughs> Whereas if you say that I'm shooting something. <laughs> oh, yeah. What is, what is this new hobby that But you I'll have? I'll be shooting in the consultation space. <laughs> oh. See that's a hack. I should I should try that. That's very clever. <laughs> so you absolutely right you know. So but I think uh, every doctor mm-hmm. should be in YouTube. the reason is that you know in that consultation space you mm-hmm. are just helping that one particular patient yeah in the youtube space you're helping you a lot of so many people you know look at all the comments that you get absolutely uh, where you never know how many lives you are touching uh, based on all the good information that they put in absolutely. so for me i think uh, i am in parasympathetic state on both maybe more on the youtube side sometimes okay. <laughs> amazing yes <laughs> because i think the the response that we get Uh, yeah. I always have a feeling that you know it had a larger purpose. Yeah. Uh, th- this is also good. I mean, gastroenterology doing endoscopies and everything, finding colon cancers and all those things. Yeah. That is a that is a definite must-have profession. Yeah. Uh, and this is a larger purpose. So, um, what I'm understanding is, okay, like, if you enjoy both, <laughs> yeah. So the stress is might be a little bit less. That's what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. So if you are curious. i feel that curiosity is the game changer whatever you do if you are curious about what is the outcome of this if i do this now suddenly your anxiety goes down because anxiety is wondering about the future with fear and curiosity takes that fear away and makes it exciting so same work same job same outcome the way you look at it depends on whether you're curious or not so if you're curious your anxiety is low and you're not really working then it's fine work 90 hours 100 hours it's fine as long as the remaining time you are resting now the controversy is i will flip that what narayan murthy said uh, around you're saying you work for 70 hours suppose you have to work for 50 hours but the remaining time you're scrolling on twitter which you think is rest you think is your personal time but twitter is full of say hate comments and you are getting into arguments with strangers you talking about my channel or no then <laughs> 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 the cortisol level goes up for everybody including the producer <laughs> everyone is stressed everyone is stressed nobody is uh, uh, technically you're not working but more harm is done to your sympathetic system in that time yeah, so it's a very so good point so scrolling on instagram or twitter you think is resting but it's not it is actually more work for your brain than doing your actual work so you have to figure out what is rest and what is work that's that's, that's very very that's important the key. yes the key. that's the key i think that's a fantastic segue yeah. to the next topic that i was thinking about you know social media per se yeah you know we are talking about i myself i have felt that you know this social media algorithm is so addictive where um what i you know initially when i started about fasting so i signed up for this uh, channel mm-hmm. okay um my uh, professor sachin panda okay okay he is my professor you know he was the one who taught me everything about uh, this time restricted feeding so i signed up for this youtube channel then and then everything about fasting came to me mm-hmm. okay and uh, let's say a person has signed up for a anti fasting channel okay yeah and the algorithm is in such a way that they will just feed the uh, videos where say fasting is bad yeah okay i think it is just a matter of chance and luck you where which bubble you land up in 
right yeah and i'm very concerned about this 20 to 30 year old yeah. where they are just trying to explore the world and they just get lobbied into this also scrolling uh, thing okay. in your practice are you seeing teenage you know like depression anxiety yeah. slightly more yeah definitely so uh I have been practicing for the last 5 years um private private practice and uh-huh. before that I was in government hospitals mm, so I won't um, I won't say that I'm seeing it more but I'm definitely I I know that a lot of patients who come to the neurology OPD with things like back pain and migraine seem to be having an underlying psychological stress now all psychiatric problems as not all but the mood disorders like depression and anxiety they lie on a spectrum so everyone is somewhere on that spectrum okay because everyone feels sad sometimes and everyone feels low mood sometimes and everyone feels anxious sometimes so you're all on that spectrum but if that anxiety increases to a point that it stops you from working your everyday jobs right or if your low mood goes uh, to com- an extent compromises your quality of life compromises your quality uh, of life or reduces your functionality, functionality yeah. so if you're not functional anymore if you're not able to maintain a good relationship if you're not able to take care of your own health if you're not able to work that is when it becomes pathological so there's physiological anxiety and there's pathological anxiety and i have seen more and more people kind of going from that physiological to that pathological Yes. Because I'll give an example. Of, yeah. uh, one of my friend, um, you know, he he he's a big Vijay fan. Okay. Vijay is a big yeah, app, yeah, of I course. Am, of course. Of course. And then uh, you know the other person is an Ajit fan. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, there is a WhatsApp group it's getting a school group. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and this guy keeps on talking about Vijay and this guy keeps on talking about Ajit and they are not stopping. And all the other people are just watching. Oh wow, yeah. good, beautiful. Oh, this guy is not responding yet. Oh, he's typing while he's waiting. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So yeah. uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that the uh, the the, uh, the the stress that yeah. is happening to a point that their kids are crying. Okay, and the wife is asking him, "Okay, no, did you buy the grocery store?" He said, "No, no, no. I need to reply to this." <laughs> right. Many of them are in that situation more yeah. than what you think. Yeah. More than what you think. That is called patholo- pa- pathological, pathological because it is compromising the quality of life. Yeah. and it is losing your functionality kind of thing. yes ah. yes this is so uh, funny because i suddenly got this scene of ancient rome and the gladiators uh-huh. and i just realized that society does not change we are always so keen to watch other people fight <laughs> whether it is in a gladiator stage with lions or, or it's on a whatsapp <laughs> group no, or, or or on big boss or on big boss <laughs> Exactly. The reason Big Boss is successful is because gladiators. Ask the gladiators, "Is he dick?" Before gladiators would be fighting with lions. Now they are like, "Who stole my toothbrush?" <laughs> That is the gladiators of today. <laughs> no, absolutely. But I think um, it might sound like very silly, right? Mm. Like you know, okay, this is we're just talking about uh, actor, right? But that particular concept mm. is so important for that person. Yeah. where they are not able to overcome even if they are very highly efficient oh yes see that is where the problem is and we need to be aware of it and then if that is the case the spouse or any other family member should bring that person to a mental health specialist. therapist ah. yes absolutely in fact when the facebook algorithm was being made they realized that messages or posts that got more hate reactions did so much better and so they started pushing those comments so as you would scroll the number of posts that would elicit the anger anger reaction would be pushed up so they got more likes they got more reactions more comments and so it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy because that's what you see more you're triggered more you will type like that and you will also find that oh my engagement is increasing if i'm typing this so overall it becomes a very hateful space and you can't even blame the algorithm because the algorithm just reflects who we are we create the algorithm no i think the algorithm is feeding on the human behavior yes. uh, and i think they are winning yes big absolutely. time <laughs> and big boss is a great example the day big boss stops being popular is when human beings evolve why do you say that 
बिकॉज द ओनली रीजन बिग बॉस इज पॉपुलर इज बिकॉज आवर प्राइमरी इंस्टिंक्ट ऑफ वॉन्टिंग टू वॉच अदर पीपल फाइट एंड आर्ग्यू इट इज वॉयरिज्म राइट वी आर वी आर वॉयरिस्टिकली एन्जॉइंग वायलेंस दैट इज आवर प्राइमरी इंस्टिंक्ट द डे वी इवॉल्व आउट ऑफ दैट एंड वी थिंक दैट दिस डज नॉट मेक एनी सेंस दैट इज द डे वी वी रियलाइज दैट ओ दर सो मच मोर टू आर ब्रेन सो यू नो इन योर experience with teenage patients you know many uh, parents have come to me and then they said that hey you know my son and daughter is always on the phone or not talking to anybody yeah. and yes i agreed that you know technology is good and they have caught into this vicious cycle what do you tell them in your practice um so i realize that it's now impossible to tell a parent that don't allow your child yeah. it's not possible it's not practical especially because so many schools and colleges have uh submissions online mm. uh they have apps mm. that they have to use mm. uh they keep in touch with their teachers and all through whatsapp so now our times have changed to the extent that unless we change all of that and go back to a non mobile world mm. it's not feasible that's not going right? to happen it's not going to happen mm. so we should be practical practical correct what is important is that when we rely on the screen for everything mm education entertainment love romance food everything there is no need to look up from the phone our entire world is on the screen now right so where the parts of our life that are unavoidable on the screen fine but there are parts that are avoidable so unless we make an active effort to come out of the phone for that it's not going to happen and kids learn from parents the amount of time that a kid spends on the phone is a direct reflection of the amount of time the parents spend on the phone because the kid is looking around and seeing that oh this phone is always in your hand so the kid's brain thinks that this is what the human body looks like and the baby is thinking my hand is empty now why why is there no phone in my hand and clearly this phone is important because the parent is always looking at the phone so a kid can know even a kid of 1 year old can follow the eyes of the parent and see what the parent is looking at and if the parent is looking at one thing a lot the kid knows that this thing is important it doesn't know why it's important but it knows it's important and now the kid's brain is thinking that whatever is important i also want so the parents wire the kid's behavior and then if they complain that the kid is on the phone all the time let's change your own behavior first but that starts right from childhood huh yeah right because the brain from uh, one year of age also it's yeah so i have had people where me and my friend were there the kid is telling the dad you are on the phone all the time right yeah and uh, the dad is like oh you know two minutes two minutes you know yeah <laughs> don't come near me when i'm on the phone yeah so this is what happened i'm talking to a, a, a my friend okay yeah. and the kid is coming towards him and then he says that when dad is on the phone i told you so many times <laughs> you should not come to me <laughs> wow role reversal huh role <laughs> and we were not talking about anything important <laughs> either <laughs> yeah maybe the new generation of kids will know that this is a problem maybe maybe because uh, our generation i think is already hooked already hooked yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there's, there's no, no coming no. out so so regarding the screen time do you tell your uh, teenage uh, patients are you limiting everything um yes so it's interesting because once they have a problem say migraine then they are much more willing to listen ah. right because now they have a reason to cut and then they are they are more conscious of it and all until then why will they believe you yes. because their life is going great yes. so it's always like that there's always some health scare and if there's a health scare you should take full advantage of that and right? you should not wait for a big one to make changes even a small health scare uh, you should make those changes with that so a teenage a teenage girl comes to your place okay yeah. let's say 18 year old yeah. okay or 20 year old comes in with a migraine headache yes. okay it's a very common complaint very common very common yeah do you have screen time as one of your treatments yes you? yes i i ask them if they are on the phone a lot invariably the parents start ranting ki main bol rahi hu i've always told her not to and the kid is going oh no and so i tell her in, in america parents are standing outside Oh yeah, yeah. If you're 18 plus, you have to ask the permission of the kid. Oh, interesting. Ah, uh, is is it okay if the parents? Are okay. Correct, correct. That's ideal. So in my practice, <laughs> the parents will come in first, 
and the kid will come in later and the parent starts talking and i have to tell the parents to shush let me ask her and even then they are it's very difficult to shush the parents because they think that the kid doesn't know yeah 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 and the parent will keep talking so i sometimes have to tell them that it's okay let me talk to her and very rarely if the kid is being very reserved i can sense that she or he wants to say some things and they don't want to talk in front of the parent so i have to make that call and i have to ask the parent that can you step out for 2 minutes i will talk to her this happens one patient a day like out of 30 40 patients one patient i have to do this where i know i can see that they want to say something but they are not comfortable talking in front of the parents uh-huh. so i have to make that call make that call yeah and then you talk about the screen time with them screen time uh-huh. it's, it's usually some personal anxiety that they have some uh-huh. personal stress that they have mm. it could be something like a relationship problem also uh-huh. they are stressed about it and if it's causing their migraine then it becomes my problem so then i have to kind of advise them about that as a neurologist you are pretty much uh, you know you know involve everything therapist you have to know a little bit because you end up doing it i think all doctors are therapists to some level um but there are still issues that doctors cannot handle because of lack of time mainly and a little bit of lack of awareness also right so they may not understand the full complexity of depression or anxiety uh, like why would a orthopedician or why would a uh, cardiologist understand the full complexity of depression they have not been trained in that so a lot of doctors especially old timers might find it offensive that you know oh i can talk to the patient but then it's a different specialty so it's always better to work together so i i have a therapist that i refer to and i have found it helps a lot so my patients improve after talking to her have you prescribed the uh, dip- antidepressant to a teenager uh, no. no no so no, not necessarily correct the interesting thing is that a lot of medication work differently at different doses so uh, say for example a drug like tri- a tricyclic antidepressant at a higher dose works as an antidepressant but at a much lower dose works as a painkiller because it soothes the because the essential yeah soothes the nervous system because at the chemical level uh, it works at that stage right it works at the neurotransmitter level so i have used tricyclic antidepressants because it works for migraine but at a much lower dose so whereas a psychiatrist might give it at a much higher dose for depression and if somebody needs that dose they will go to a psychiatrist i will send them to a psychiatrist but if they have migraine a very low a very low dose of antidepressant can work so it depends on patient to patient what they need um what i was trying to get at was so just limiting screen time improving health lifestyle measures will that take care of the migraine problem 90% yes it will but over a time but if somebody is having headache today i can't expect them to wait for 3 months for the headache to go because these things take time so many patients require medicines for a f- couple of weeks Even while yes but much shorter so 2 3 days uh so we have to tell them that they have to be patient and over 2 3 weeks the medicines will work but you have to tell them that if you don't want to be on medicine for a long time lifestyle change is the only way and most of them 90% of them will have benefit with lifestyle with life changes. changes but but one of the lifestyle changes to limit the screen time yes. but, but it's very difficult to limit the screen time because yeah. you keep scrolling correct yeah. and what is that mechanism you know i know there is something called dopamine hit and everything yes, yes. can you explain to the audience as well please so in simple terms dopamine is an is a motivation molecule okay people used to think it's a happiness molecule it's not the happiness molecule. it's not a happiness molecule no uh-huh. dopamine does not itself make you happy dopamine rises when there is anticipation of happiness when you feel that you are about to be happy that is when dopamine is at its peak so for example if i give you a gift okay and that gift is a book and it's a good book you take the book and you think oh i see the book you have a chin to little dopamine spike so you are little happy i gift wrap the book with a nice ribbon and with a word saying surprise exclamation mark and i gift it to you now your dopamine is this high because your brain is thinking what can it be what can it be what can it be and the the moment that you're un, that you're unwrapping the gift that is when dopamine is at its peak as soon as you've opened it and you see the book your dopamine starts falling down because now you know what it is 
you're not unhappy but you're not as happy as you were just before you opened it that's why reels work because as soon as you've opened one reel you've got that dopamine spike as you're watching the reel your dopamine is falling 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 now you need another hit what can you do for the next hit just one swipe so the amount of effort it needs for that next dopamine hit has never been smaller right a smoker will need to take out a cigarette put it in his mouth light it wait for the wind to stop find a corner then take a drag then he will get that hit but here it just that's it just one muscle has to move and you've got the next hit so the amount of effort it takes for a dopamine hit has never been smaller that's why scrolling is so and then scrolling takes hours to gather sometimes yeah and what can we do to stop it you like <laughs> any tips and tricks that you do i mean i i have been into that situation as well i tell patients not to do it but sometimes you know while we are doing this youtube thing you know you look at your video yeah and then you your videos come through what to say this doing now yeah uh, and what is this mom doing now <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a it's a dangerous spiral yes <laughs> so even without your conscious decision and subconsciously you keep scrolling i think it's safe to say that if you're scrolling so deep huh. that you've reached my mom's instagram <laughs> channel it's definitely time to stop <laughs> I would say that <laughs> so, <laughs> because she doesn't even have a public account. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is. No, just joking. You know, like you know, you keep on seeing the same thing. Yeah. So your thing comes up, and Correct, every ah, uh, every doctor thing comes up. Correct. Because you know the algorithm feeds. Exactly. And uh, sometimes I have been in the vicious cycle as well. Yeah. Um, maybe you know, one time I told my patients and create a timer. Yes. Ha, uh, I said okay, you know, your your sleep time as you as you know, right, you know, we always say that you go to the bed at the same time. Yeah. You wake up at the same time yeah. so that your circadian rhythm is good. Yeah. And then when you wake up, go to bed let's say 11 p.m. Hmm. and you want to scroll. Preferably don't scroll at all, but if you yeah. scroll, create a timer for 15 minutes. Hmm. So I generally what I advise ideally is that um, the last 15 20 minutes before your sleep should be screen free right and it should not be in bed now that is very difficult to understand but that is ideal because your bed should be a temple for sleep and sex but mainly sleep because if you associate that with screen then your brain will keep turning towards that so there is a transition time for a week where you're uncomfortable but just put the phone for charging on another table another room and come to sleep and you in a week's time you'll be fine and you'll get much better sleep so the last 15 minutes ideally should be in the dark lights off and um, no screens and no stressful conversation in the last 30 minutes before going yeah. to bed i mean that's ideal <laughs> i mean but <laughs> for married only... couples you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you should buy a separate house <laughs> Yeah, married couples, it's it can be tricky because that's the time that you know people get exactly uh, time for themselves. That's what they exactly. think. Exactly, and um, all the arguments of the day have kind of piled up for that moment. Yes, I tell my wife, I respect your decision of bringing this argument right now. I will answer tomorrow. Really? You do that? You have separate rooms? <laughs> no, after that discussion, I had a separate room. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think we underestimate you know similar to that wake up morning routine there is a sleeping routine as well correct yes, ah it has to be a sleeping routine yes ah, absolutely so, amazing ah so moving on to the next segment of this yes. podcast where I have a strong feeling that you know your stress sleep whatever you we talked about so far is tied down to obesity yeah and uh, how I say that you know your gut bacteria makes you crave for what you need. Yeah, I have a feeling that your stress and lack of sleep also makes you crave. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> what you want even more maybe than the gut bacteria, and uh, we are in a obesity pandemic, and we're also in a mental health yet to be a pandemic as well. Yeah, and you know we are not that unfortunate to have multiple diseases at the same time. Right, it has to be linked together. Yeah, it has to be linked together. Yeah, um, in your practice, you think that the people who are coming to your practice now, compared to before, is obesity has been more compared to before, or it's almost be the same that you are just diagnosing mental health issues more. Obesity in the younger population 
definitely is on the high younger is age group uh so let's say less than 30 less than 30. less than 30 so around 20 24 25 um definitely more and more people because i see very little above 50 year olds who are obese most of them are their bmi is reasonably okay but um many of them less than 30 they are they are on the obese side and now they come to you for what um most commonly usually with some sort of pain uh neck physical pain symptoms. back yes physical ah. symptoms because they are also people who are leading kind of sedentary lives they might be uh, on their laptop all day uh, typing all the day so then they could have a lot of neck pain they also have carpal tunnel ha huh. quite often because of the typing um carpal so, tunnel is explained there in the so carpal tunnel is pain on your wrist and your hands because of a nerve called median nerve which gets compressed uh in the wrist and this is associated with obesity because of a uh, certain bad positioning of the wrist uh, that can happen and because of the fat tissues uh, uh, accumulating yes. there is lack of movement of the nerve there is a lack of movement uh, yes. and that's why when your lean person types in they might not get carpal tunnel that much compared to an obese patient yes uh, uh, but of course there are yes. lean people also yes. but um, we see this association a lot uh, so obese people do come in and there i feel like there is a general increase in that incidence of course nowhere close to what it is in the west you know so i was reading about this um, obesity obesity being so common in the west uh, where there is a dichotomy where somebody is either very fit or quite obese yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it's almost as if there is no middle ground anymore in the west especially in the us correct um and i i would love to ask you about why is that why is it so i i spread I, out I, over there i think it is environment mm. if you go to san francisco downtown everybody will be running around right sometimes without clothes that is not a good thing <laughs> Well, freedom can mean different things to different people maybe not that much amount of freedom <laughs> it's a it's a iso for others <laughs> yeah uh, but if let's let's say the same person if you put them in birmingham alabama which is mm. a southern most state uh, in uh, us yeah. where obesity is pretty common okay because they say that obesity runs in their families mm. that's not true because nobody run in the family <laughs> So you know you know this like said you know in neurology yeah. you say that you are what you are surrounded by the five people that you actually Correct. interact with. Correct. That is exactly true what is happening in US. Right. Exactly true. If you look at San Francisco and LA Hollywood uh main areas yeah. it's all everybody is like running around right. working out and right. all the gym memberships are like you know so crazy expensive. Right. Uh, right. And people do pilates two times a day. Yeah. Uh, so if you go to Alabama and they do yoga except they do yoga tm because it is registered in the us now <laughs> <laughs> they do hot yoga hot yoga. yeah <laughs> then they re- then only realize that hot means the temperature <laughs> 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 so that's what the environment is i okay. think it's absolutely in us uh, yeah. that's your question it's based on the environment, environment and i yeah. can see that that might be happening here as well yeah. if you classify between urban and rural areas yes i think so urban cities are a little bit obese yes that rate of obesity is increasing more um because of again like you said lifestyle the work from home culture you don't have to travel much you can you don't have to there is no social pressure to exercise ha huh. you know so unless you are part of that group there's no in the traditional indian family there's no social pressure to exercise um there's, there's no a social, social pressure to perform well in academics exactly ah. right there's a lot of that there's social pressure to get married right. and which is why before marriage there's a lot of social pressure to exercise because you want to a find a partner and b look good in the wedding photos after marriage no more social pressure you can <laughs> let yourself go and there's no one who will say anything the only goal is to for me is to fit in the marriage shervani <laughs> <laughs> correct absolutely absolutely yeah. so but but you are uh, uh, basically agreeing to the fact that you know mental health and obesity is pretty much uh, associated um, closely or not no that's so those are two different Separate. things uh-huh. um so 
there are lifestyle choices that can affect both. So for example, less exercise has an impact on both obesity. Less exercise leads to obesity. But less exercise can also mean there are less endorphins, there are less, your brain activity slows down, which can be one of the contributing factors to a mental health problem. So we cannot say that obesity leads to mental health, but there are common factors that lead to both. Uh, so for example, stress can lead to stress eating, which can lead to obesity, but stress can also lead to anxiety and depression. So stress is the common factor. So that somebody who is who has obesity because of stress could also have a mental health problem. So there are these, it's like this web of interconnected things. And we still cannot say that one thing leads to another because I feel that is too simplistic. You know, uh, it might be us trying to find a simple answer that if you're obese, then you're then you have a mental health issue. But it's not so straightforward. There are multiple other things that affect each other, which is also why people don't get into it. Because it's too much of cognitive load, you know, they don't want to think so much. Um, but definitely there is an interconnection between obesity, stress, migraine and mental health problems like anxiety and depression. They're all connected to each other. Mm. Yes. But when you exercise a little bit more the risk goes down. Goes down. Risk goes down. Yes, okay. absolutely. And when you were saying stress eating, I think this is the most common complaint that people come to me when I say, uh, I know that you will uh, agree to the statement that, you know, from a GI standpoint, mm -hmm. gastroenterology standpoint, mm -hmm. I tell my patient is that don't expect me to prescribe medications. For weight loss? Uh, no, for GI problems. Okay. You do weight loss. That is the treatment. Ah, hmm. uh, fifty percent, even I will say hundred percent sometimes yeah. that that plays a major role yeah. in all your GI problems, correct? correct? And the first answer that they say is that you know I'm very stressed out, and whenever I'm stressed out, yeah. I reach for the chips, I reach for the thing. Yeah. And what is this connection between stress and emotional eating? Yeah. Uh, is that dopamine is more, or that is uh, they are satisfying uh, that with the food craving? So when you eat. Mm. Eating is a parasympathetic action. So you eat and you feel rested. Okay. So stress is a sympathetic activity, which is against parasympathetic. So whenever you're sympathetic, you are alert, you are active, you want to do things. But when you're too sympathetic, that is when you're too stressed out, your body desperately wants you to come back towards parasympathetic. Yes, it is a kind of auto-regulation. Now, there are many ways to convert sympathetic into parasympathetic. You can sleep. You can sit with your friends and look and laugh. You can just close your eyes and do some deep breathing. You can chant. You can meditate. You can go for a walk. All of these things are parasympathetic activities. But you can also eat. Now, amongst all these things, Eating is probably the easiest because it is right in front of you. You don't even have to get up. For everything else, you have to put in some effort. But there's a bag of chips. You are stressed out. Now, would I rather go down for a walk, which takes physical effort, or can I just open this bag of chips and eat something? And as soon as I eat it, my body goes into parasympathetic. So I feel better. Now I can go back to work. So now there is a connection between working and relaxing by eating, which is what stress eating means. It is like a emergency parasympathetic booster, right? So it's like firefighting where there is fire and there is, you break the glass and you take out the fire extinguisher and you put it, except here the fire extinguisher is a bag of chips. Uh -huh. So the problem is that we become so used to putting out fire by eating the bag of chips that we don't realize that you should not have so much fire in the first place. So the chips packet is red in color. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which is also why McDonald's is red, all the burger, uh. Uh, because we associate red with hunger, food, uh. you know, it's it's bright, you chase it. I chase it. Uh. Um, uh. So having that connection is one of the problems with obesity. Wow. So whenever you're stressed, you'll eat. So one tip that I tell all my patients is that, okay, you know, take all the junk foods out of your closet. Hmm. You can eat when you go out to huh. start with. That's what huh. I say. So take, you know, in uh, many of my South Indian patients, ask for murku. 
Yes, of course. Okay, and uh, they say I love muruk. I said, you know, yes, you can have muruk if you are going to a friend's place or a get together or a mm. potluck or something. I don't want, especially when I when I do this fasting method, talking to them, I say yes. that the first step that you should do was go and eat all the muruk at your place right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why they love you <laughs> for the first visit. <laughs> And then from next time, no muruk at all. I'm not saying don't eat it. Mm. Go and eat whenever you are outside. Right. So I think now, so then when they're stressed out, they don't have anything to yes. eat. Yes. Yes. And then they're forced to unsubscribe from my channel. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other way. No other. No other solution that they can think of. So my personal demon is the is what we call sharkaru peri, which is um, those banana chips that are uh, made with jag- banana chips. jaggery. Jaggery. Have you seen those? Ah, ah, ah. You you yes. make it with jaggery. Yes. I love those. <laughs> I <It's>, do. <laughs> <laughs> so the my problem is that I I have a magic trick where one second they are there and the next second they've gone. <laughs> and my mom is always amazed that oh this full bag of jaggery chips where did it go? Like, Ta-da! <laughs> my friends, I don't know. I say different magic trick. You close your eyes. There's a second packet that comes. <laughs> this is the this is the main issue so the way the advice that i give is that you can eat whatever you want okay but you have to earn it ah uh. so evolutionarily you can only eat something that you've worked for okay so if you're a monkey and you want you have to eat a fruit you have to climb a tree right if you're a tiger you have to eat a deer you have to hunt it you have to kill it then only you will eat it correct So whatever you worked for you can eat. So eat whatever you want if you are making it. If you are uh, if you are cooking it. Oh cooking it. Ha ha. If you have made it so you buy the raw materials you cook it you make it you eat it no problem. The problem is that you have not earned that packet of chips. Right? You have not grown the potatoes you have not even bought the potatoes you have not cut them you have not fried them you have not put the masala on them nothing. so our bo- but our brain doesn't know that so when our brain eats such a high calorie food our brain thinks that such a high calorie food means you have earned this high calorie food so it gives you a lot of dopamine because high calorie food is very hard to come in the jungle but here just opening a packet of chips and eating it our brain gives you so much dopamine that you've not deserved right so no packet foods eat whatever you want but no packet foods according to me out of all the diets this is probably the best one you cook and you eat whatever you want your body will get used to it right over a period of time the body will get used to it especially if something that you've grown up with but nobody's grown up with chips it's a very new phenomenon evolutionarily we are not used to such high density Processed, processed foods, high fat. Yeah. Mm. So, I would my take on diet would be that everything cooked is fine. Good, but, but at the time of stress eating, stressful eating, uh, alternative methods is like um, okay. So let's say I, I have let's say my patient, okay, mm. and I've said there is no snacks at all, and they're stressed. They want mm. to bring the you know limbic uh, system to the prefrontal cortex. Thing. Yes. Okay. So when they do that, what do they? How, what else they can do? Uh, I have read something about this vagal nerve stimulation and yes, all those things. Yes. Yes. Uh, that Valsalva maneuver and all those things help. Uh, so Valsalva doesn't help so much, but deep breathing helps. So when you stretch the diaphragm in uh, under your lungs, when you expand your lungs with air, your diaphragm gets stretched. The diaphragm will activate the vagus nerve, and it will activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you de- take a deep breath. and you count from 1 to 5 and you exhale slowly and you keep doing this five times your body will automatically shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic so this is probably the simplest way so when they say that if you're angry you should count to 10 and take a deep breath it is just this you're angry you're in sympathetic overdrive you take a deep breath and you count to 10 you're coming back into parasympathetic so coming back to parasympathetic means in your brain you're going from limbic to prefrontal now you are calmer you have more control you will not say stupid things that you will regret later 
So this is the simplest way. Wow. Yeah. You know, I while you were saying this, I am picturizing a patient in front yeah. of me. Uh, I was getting a consent for the procedure for endoscopy. Yes. And then he got a phone call. Huh. And then he took the phone call. And then all of a sudden he was talking to me. And then uh, he was talking on the phone. And then he kept like this. And then he said. Yeah. Right. And then I said, who are you talking to? He said, my wife. <laughs> No, we have been like bashing my wife. Um, I, I think I have need to go back to home. <laughs> <laughs> like you said, my hospital does not see the podcast. Okay. I hope your wife does Why not see the podcast. <laughs> But actually, it's the other way around. My wife does that when I talk to her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I was shocked. That's the first time that I have seen somebody yeah. actually seeing that in front of me. Yeah. And he said he was like sixty-five years old, yeah. and he said, "Doctor Pal, you need to do this. Yeah. Ah, uh, take this step." and then you know take a deep breath and yeah. then uh, exhale to 5 seconds yeah. like, wow so th- what chanting does is uh, just take this concept and add another layer which is vibrating your vocal cords so your vocal cords are also controlled by a branch of the vagus nerve recurrent laryngeal nerve karke hai so that branch also activates the vocal cords so when you are chanting basically what it means is that your uh, vocal cords are vibrating now that in itself can be an activator of the vagus nerve so it increases the vagal tone these are all very transient spikes okay it's not going to be a massive difference but in that moment that's all you need so whenever people are chanting om for mm. example like like om like deep jump. deep down ah. so that word om mm. people i think uh, attribute a lot of spiritual significance to that word itself but it is actually a syllable and the focus is not on the word but it is on the sound coming from your throat so when the sound is leaving your throat it's oh and then eventually when you put your lips together it becomes mm that's all it is so the focus is on the vibrating vocal cord so that your body shifts into parasympathetic and you feel calm that's the important thing wow yeah wow it's really good you feel something <laughs> yeah, when you do this <laughs> <laughs> wow wow super so so all this we are talking about that stress emotional eating thing yeah. and this was the tips and tricks that we can cut down to cut down uh, to cut down correct um the other mm-hmm. end of the spectrum is where people are obese yeah. okay by the uh, weighing scale body sure. mass index and fat percentage and yeah. everything um and there is one school of thought where they say that love your body hmm correct and uh, when you say love your body there is a fine line where you need to be a little bit aware that this kind of an this end of the spectrum where your body mass index is slightly high uh, it's okay to love the body at the same time there are some health consequences associated with that as well right and i get this uh, uh, concept all the time that my audience is that hey what is about body positivity right you know you need to love your body so it is this is what i am and my body mass index is 35 so what it is what i am so w- i'm still trying to wrap my head around in terms of how yeah. do i convince that patient that you know what body mass index is 35 is okay yeah as long as it is not causing any health problems mm. and i'm saying that it is at an increased risk of all the things that we're talking about yeah from a neurological standpoint what is that body positivity about is that something yeah. like a confidence that they get so in my mind i try to look at it as scientifically as possible which is that your ultimate risk is because of inflammation okay so you are at increased risk of heart attacks you are increased risk of stroke inflammation is like a burning volcano inside the body burning in the body ah, burning in the body right mm. so that burning is basically your body creating inflammatory cells because it thinks that it is under attack now obesity is a pro inflammatory state so the more obese you are the more inflammation is there in your body which is what causes the risk of heart attacks and stroke now a poor self image when you look at yourself in the mirror and you hate yourself is also a pro inflammatory state so when you look at yourself and you hate yourself what happens is that there is a part of the brain called insula insula is responsible for self awareness how you perceive your own body to be 
okay now if what you if you have a self image of someone who is thin and you see a mirror that shows you as a fat person there is a conflict and your brain rejects this image okay so there is a conflict in the brain and that causes stress and that causes anxiety which increases your inflammation okay and that is also a problem so if there is somebody who is looking at the mirror and seeing a fat person and they know that they are a fat person so there is no conflict anymore then at least that stress is gone ah, they are at peace with the body they are at peace with their with body the, ah. so that inflammation is gone great otherwise you are adding inflammation on top of inflammation so there's double the problem so if somebody is fat and they're stressed or they're feeling guilty about being fat to the point that their body is rejecting itself then they are at twice the risk so starting may i would definitely say be at peace it's okay it's okay mm. right like if if you are 100 kgs we can't shift you to ideal body weight in a day it will take what a year that one year let's avoid additional damage through negative self talk so positive body image very important okay be at peace with yourself but that doesn't mean that people don't change right so a a 50 kg person can become an 80 kg person that can also create body image issue but a 100 kg person can become a 70 kg person whatever is your ideal body weight you should try to become that so body positivity means i am who i am but wanting to lose weight means this is not who i want to be later so this distinction has to be made so the problem happens when people say i want to be thin now then there is a problem so the language has to be very clear i am obese that's okay but in 2025 i don't want to be obese so i'm at peace now but i want to be peaceful later but i want to be a peaceful thinner person Uh, but let me ask you this way where they don't want to be thin at all okay yeah and they just want to be where they were yeah and we as doctors we know that there is a increased risk of all these health complications what is your way to tell them that you know i think you must at least consider decreasing the bmi because there's an increased risk of all this what is your uh, uh, way to um, explain to them in a very yeah uh, so i believe that the role of the doctor is to provide knowledge facts facts and uh, that fact should be given in as empathetic a way as possible so that the patient does not feel attacked it sometimes is very difficult for the patient to remember that the doctor is on their side right nobody is attacking them is the ultimately what ev- everyone wants is for them to be healthy yes so this message has to get across very clearly but at the end of the day uh, every patient has autonomy decision making decision making mm-hmm. so if somebody is an alcoholic right you tell them that you should stop drinking they don't stop drinking they don't stop drinking but then when they come to you with an alcohol related problem you will not say i told you so you should go that is your own ego so that is the doctor's ego coming in the way the doctor's job is not i told you so doctor's job is to treat the patient in whatever condition they come in and then give them advice about how to live a better life but if they don't the doctor doesn't have to take it personally that i have failed as a doctor it's not like that every patient has their own journey right so i feel that a lot of times the person who's trying to help their own ego comes in the way <laughs> it's fine you give them all the information so that they should never feel that i wasn't told but then at the end of the day the decision is theirs uh-huh. yeah yeah uh-huh. it's a huge thing in us yeah it's i can understand it's a huge thing in us yeah, yeah. Of course. and uh, i always say you know i i, I have a template and then i say oh increase body mass index increase risk of diabetes hypertension stroke colon cancer and all those things now you can choose yeah <laughs> correct but they they if when they feel attacked then they are less likely to ha, uh, ha, listen correct, correct you know so i always say that um, you know when i promote this uh, fasting method um, yeah. i start very slowly i said you know i don't say that oh you know this, you are going to lose weight in one year ha. and i say that you know right now you have this liver enzyme elevation yeah okay for this liver enzyme elevation to come back to normal you need to do this yeah similar to how you said that you know when there's a problem with migraine it's very easy correct uh, same thing the trick that i use yeah 
for some some hook that the they hook. can use uh-huh. yeah the issue is that it's before they start on a weight loss journey i believe that there are certain mental uh, states of mind that they have to work on mm-hmm. for example resilience mm-hmm. how to handle stress should be something that they fig- learn mm-hmm. before they embark on their weight loss journey because you need a lot of resilience to go through it and invariably pe- the reason people want people don't want to do it is because they are afraid nothing else people are just afraid of what will happen if they start try and they fail so then they would rather not try at all and say i'm happy with this so it is a kind of defense mechanism so it's completely understandable uh, it's like uh if a, if a, if you tell a child that you have to study to get good marks and the child feels that they can't then they will say mujhe nahi padhna hai i will i don't want to study then they you know they'll they'll try and do something else so uh that empathy has to be very correct frank. individualized yeah mm-hmm. because i've realized that putting yourself or if the patient feels like you are against them correct then that is nothing is going to happen nothing will happen nothing will happen then mm. neither the patient will benefit nor will nor you benefit, benefit. Yeah. So. and then you keep seeing the patient repeatedly correct mm. that's what happening yeah. so in in for example uh, that brings to the next segue where you know i promote this um, sunrise to sunset method mm. of uh, eating uh, that's what we did some research in uh, my uh, lab and uh, not my lab in my professor's lab uh-huh. uh, and then we found out that okay you know if you respect your circadian rhythm all the hormones what you talked about you know the yeah. melatonin cortisol everything yeah. works at night yeah uh, growth hormone comes and repairs all the hormones at night yeah. Yeah. all the damage that ha- happens at night and then you know we wake up in the morning uh, with good 7 hours of quality sleep and then a minimum of 12 hours of fasting um, that's what our nature demands okay. um, so uh, when i say that people understand and then i to say them hey this is a method that work for me it's not for everybody you try it out and then say so they try it out for like a month or two hmm. and then they absolutely love it okay okay because they start seeing changes hmm. but the problem is in terms of consistency hmm. okay and then what is happening is you know yes i i know that this is good for me right ah uh, but i'm so busy that i'm not able to prioritize this yeah. okay and then i say that oh, okay you know do this on a daily basis it become a habit and all thing mm-hmm. i want to ask from a neurologist yeah. in terms of what is this habit forming loop mm. and how long does it take for a person to bite the bullet and yeah. do this uh and then it becomes a habit and not with a willpower yeah so i'm glad that we earlier spoke about limbic system and prefrontal cortex because that is the framework to understand habit also so a habit is an action that initially starts from the limbic system uh initially starts from the prefrontal cortex so for the audience prefrontal cortex is the uh, is the more evolved recent part of the brain it is right behind the forehead and um, it matures throughout the life but it reaches reaches adult maturity by 25 whereas the limbic system is behind its under your brain it is an old part of the brain and that is what is responsible for your emotions instinct uh, love anger jealousy all of those things come from the limbic system it's like the opposite on the spectrum yeah uh, to uh, correct uh, but they both need each other need each other huh. and they are always in conflict huh. <laughs> or mostly they are in conflict, conflict. which is interesting because um, going a little deeper into neuroscience there is a part called as the anterior cingulate cortex singulate cortex looks like my anatomy class uh, yeah <laughs> so the anterior singulate cortex is literally like the meeting room between pre- prefrontal cortex and limbic so whenever there is a conflict the anterior singulate cortex lights up so, uh, on mri say it again whenever there's a conflict whenever there's a conflict between emotion and logic ha huh. oh this path we get anterior singulate cortex is what lights up so this i this is called the acc ha, ha, ha. the acc is responsible for all conflict resolution mm, mm. and it is always working so i always think that the most overworked part of our brains is the acc, ACC. because we are always arguing between prefrontal and limbic wow yeah. and the prefrontal is the area where you initiate the habit trying yes. to form the habit it is logical logical it plans in the future ah, all of that ah. so a limbic cannot plan to the future ah. that's the problem i see So the reason habits are so difficult is because the limbic can only plan for uh, one or two minutes, ten minutes. That's it. So it might s- seem that oh, I should go to the gym, but the effect of the gym will come after six months. 
our limbic system does not care after 6 months our limbic system says abhi what so, now so limbic cortex is like amazon prime start two immediate. day delivery <laughs> yes two day delivery immediate drone immediate. delivery drone delivery so given the option between eating a cake which will feel good now versus going to the gym which will feel good after 3 months the prefrontal says gym limbic says cake the anterior cingulate cortex has to decide and so whichever one is more powerful will convince the anterior cingulate cortex that pick me wow so the more wow, it looks like my older son and younger son yes <laughs> exactly and the older son is the limbic system limbic system ah. and the prefrontal cortex is the newer son newer ah. correct so that newer kid has to prove itself ah. saying that i also know i am not a kid anymore ah. i am also a grown up now it has to prove itself wow that is the only way the parents will listen wow otherwise they will think that of course the older kid is more mature it has been going on for billions of years prefrontal cortex evolved only like uh, you know 500 million years ago so it's very young in evolutionary terms so so we need to make sure the limbic system works uh, prefrontal cortex works more than the yes. limbic system yes ah. so the only way you can form habits is if the prefrontal cortex has more veto power against limbic and that veto power cannot happen just like that so the prefrontal cortex needs to get a lot of practice in saying no to the limbic system wow wow so saying no is an independent exercise it doesn't matter what you say no to just say no to the limbic again and again just to keep your prefrontal cortex more active and religion has understood this very long ago so all those things right um in if you say christianity seven cardinal sins right so those are all the things that we would have liked to do our limbic system would want to do which is gluttony so you want to eat food lust which is you want to have sex or porn or masturbation or anything so all of that comes from limbic and those are all considered as sins so it is christianity says say no to these things in a way it is saying make your prefrontal cortex more powerful correct and the more powerful your prefrontal is the easier it is to form a habit so you're saying the next time when you are let's say in my example so a patient decides to stop eating at 8 pm hmm. and then he is having a buffet or a get together at 9 pm yeah. okay and he goes to the buffet and he keeps uh, based on what you're saying he has to keep on saying no 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 yeah so and then eventually if he if he had have one it's totally okay because it's totally okay ah uh, so i have this rule that again to make your prefrontal stronger say you want to eat a cake the limbic says eat it now if you can just say i'll eat it after one hour that is your prefrontal cortex becoming stronger that's it just one hour later same cake but now when you eat it your prefrontal is calling the shots but if you eat it immediately your limbic is calling the shots so delaying gratification is a prefrontal strengthening activity that i will i want it but i won't have it now that's it so you can time your vices suppose if you say that sunday morning 9 am i'll eat a cake absolutely okay that's your prefrontal cortex but you have to wait till then so you have to do these tricks you have to keep strengthening your prefrontal cortex wow see see i think maybe that's why people say that you know initially when i say okay stop eating at 8 pm so they say you know it was very difficult doctor but after 2 3 weeks i tell myself that okay i have biryani at 9 pm which my uh, spouse ordered somebody but i kept it in the fridge i woke up in the morning and then i ate it so i think they have satisfying two things one is they are strengthening the prefrontal cortex and also they are having the biryani <laughs> absolutely fine I I always say that if you can go to sleep today huh. knowing exactly what all you will eat tomorrow huh. all day huh. you will automatically eat healthy plan your meals yes ah. but you have to know ah snacks drink a dessert everything I mean, I mean no means like specific okay this is the snack that I'm going to eat at, at this, this time, time. Ah. even if it is quote unquote unhealthy at least you're not binging so you're giving your prefrontal cortex power So later on one month later when you decide to go on a diet you'll find it much easier because now your prefrontal cortex is used to having its commands listened to 
otherwise it gets tired right it will keep making these plans and ultimately we are doing what the limbic is saying it will get frustrated that nobody is listening to me i don't have any power in this house so it needs to give be given that importance i see so after two weeks the pre, you know let's say new resolution january 1 i think the prefrontal cortex like rides over the limbic system yeah full energy full energy yeah. january 1 midnight <laughs> ghost yeah the limbic is saying ho gaya you had your moment in the sun now go back <laughs> now go back so i think the january 2nd going down if you keep saying no 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 that january 2nd might go to january 10th next year yes ah. so basically january 2nd to december 31st is limbic and january 1st is prefrontal <laughs> for most people <laughs> correct <laughs> correct so yeah. you need to train your mind yeah and then what do they say that you know be, it's okay to be uncomfortable it train your mind to be uncomfortable correct all right so uh, whenever we thing. are slightly uncomfortable mm. the limbic wants you to come back to comfort correct mm. saying that oh this is scary mm. uh, we don't know what will happen mm. and the limbic is a drama queen <laughs> slightly uncomfortable and it says you will die <laughs> okay that's what it is anything uncomfortable and you will die it doesn't know anything else so you go up on stage the first time so many people are looking at you limbic is saying you will die so many people are looking at you if they are judging you they will throw you out of the community you know they will judge you and you will uh. not get anything to eat uh. you will re- you'll be rejected but after some time the prefrontal cortex gains control of the limbic and says shut up they are all liking me and then eventually the limbic starts enjoying it a full circle the full circle ah. and then the limbic and the prefrontal join hands that is when the habit becomes real so now i enjoy going to the gym i enjoy swimming so now there's no conflict and so habit is formed until the prefrontal has to insist it's not a habit so it's it's almost like a divorce ha- waiting to happen and your marriage counselor is trying to make peace uh and then one point of time after 6 months of therapy both are joining join and now they work together point that's together. a happy marriage so every habit is actually a happy, happy marriage, marriage between prefrontal and limbic <laughs> <laughs> habit is the baby <laughs> and you can have more babies you can have more, babies. more babies once you know how to raise one correct then to <laughs> after the third one you don't even know how many kids are there in the room <laughs> exactly <laughs> which is why our grandfathers used to be very disciplined they have eight eight kids eight eight kids ah yeah. even the, the the grandfather says the kid yeah. okay you know better you listen to me yeah. if not i'll make one more exactly <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly how <laughs> habits are born habits are born <laughs> <laughs> maybe my grandfather should not hear this <laughs> but uh, the number he, of people who should not hear this podcast <laughs> is more than the number of people who should <laughs> but you have 10 kids man yeah uh, exactly uh-huh. yeah his habit was very strong i know <laughs> earlier they used to think they have no self control but it turns out they have a lot of self control <laughs> wow wow i think this is one of the best to take away to my audience you know in terms of this limbic system yeah. and uh, prefrontal cortex yeah. every nice habit doesn't have to be exercise diet even you know meditation everything correct mm. everything follows this same format format and um one of the good things is that prefrontal strength is transferable so if you learn it in one discipline you will find it easier and easier to uh, apply it to other skills wow. it's just about learning it in one skill but you have to learn it completely completely let me ask you this you know i always you know i look skinny but i'm not healthy okay because i have a body fat percentage okay my body fat percentage is 24 uh, for um, uh, men it's around 20 is considered uh, normal it's not a big thing but still yeah. uh, is it different for indian indian sub population uh, uh, uh. even less it has to be less oh really uh. <laughs> how much so for men it's usually for um, 17 to 20% wow okay virat kohli is 13 10, 10 to 13% my man i mean yeah on big uh, all these uh, you know bodybuilders and everything the body fat percentage is like 4 5 okay and uh, men women have a slight leeway of course uh, because yeah. of the hormonal thing they can yeah. even have like 25 27% correct for me when i was big i was 38% really yeah and now it's 25 yes i am skinny 
but I'm fat and that's why I'm skinny fat. Yeah, that term. Is that a pro- re- real term, skinny it's a fat? real term for Indian people. Okay. Mainly for our Southeast Asian population. Okay. There's a study called Masala Study in uh, UCS, um, San Francisco area, where they do just take patients from Southeast Asian population. Indians, Asians, everybody looks skinny. Mm. But the body fat percentage is high. Especially for South Indians, especially for South Indians, Belly fat is a big thing because yeah. we're genetically predisposed as well. Correct. So well, it's all that rice that uh, <laughs> we've been eating for centuries. Not rice and also your department, you know, stress, sleep, everything comes down as well. <laughs> so uh, for me, I always wanted to get to that 17%. Mm. I always wanted, I wanted to lift weight. I want to eat right, uh, protein and everything. I, I will never go back to my 38% that I have uh, created that ACC. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not going to go there. Yeah. But I'm not able to create this discipline about working out four to five times a week mm-hmm. of eating the protein intake of one to 1.25 gram per kilo right. on a consistent basis, more than three to four months. Mm-hmm. Okay. So based on our discussion, what I'm going to take now is, okay, next I will do it for six weeks. Oh, I do this 30 day challenge. Uh, I motivate my audience so that I get motivated myself yeah. or I become a role model for them. And after 30 days, something or the other happens, some shoot or something like that or some uh, work happens and it goes down. So next time what I'm going to do is when something happens, I'm going to train my prefrontal cortex. I'm going to say no. Sid Warrior has told, told yes. right? You better hit the gym even if it is for five minutes. Yes. Uh, you go there, you break that connection. Yes, and uh, you reduce resistance as much as possible. Uh, Even if you can't go to the gym, do 50 push-ups. Right there. Right there. Uh, uh, because our, the limbic keeps coming up with excuses. Uh, if you pay attention, our brain keeps coming up with excuses to not do something. And that's the limbic testing you. Literally testing how resilient you are. And every time you break that excuse, it becomes a little calmer. Until there are no excuses, until all of it stops. But you have to keep doing it. That initial part is difficult. It's like training a new pet in your house. If you get a puppy, initially it can be anything. But then you train it properly and it will be a very well-behaved puppy. And the next 10 years of your life is going to go very well. But if you don't train it and it just starts biting everybody who comes in, you your life is so chaotic. right? So you have to put in that initial training work. Which is why kids who are brought up in disciplined households actually have an easier time. Easier time. Huh. Yeah. Your example will change when you have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> so now you're saying puppy, now you'll say if you, you be sleep train your kid, your sleep quality will get better. Don't be like the Indian family where all four people sleep together in the same bed where the husband lies down on the ground. <laughs> I've heard of this sleep training kids is a big thing. Yes. Big thing. And then, you know, Indian parents, they have this uh, mentality that, you know, if the kid sleeps separately, yeah. the bonding is lost. Yeah, uh, They won't love you. They won't love you. They won't love you. And they are, especially mothers, I mean, I fall some fathers as well, <laughs> but, <laughs> but not me. I said, my sleep quality is very important. Of course. Uh, I told my, tell my wife as well, your sleep quality is important as well. How are we going to have all four people in this queen size bed? <laughs> Eventually, my older son Arjun kicks me out. Yeah. Uh, and then I say, okay, thank you so much. This is the best thing ever happened to me. <laughs> so I go to a different room. Uh, and then I sleep very well when I'm on call. Because <laughs> okay. whenever I'm on call, Priya, my wife Priya itself will say, yeah. you go to the separate room, you know, you might be busy. Yeah. Even though nobody will call. <laughs> but anyways, wonderful discussion. I think this is, I'm going to take your, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm going yeah. to take this very seriously. Yeah. Next time I'm coming to meet you, I will be having a six pack. Wow. Or maybe not. A- wow. You've said it on a podcast. There <laughs> no, are no, three no. cameras <laughs> pointing at you and two microphones. <laughs> okay. Maybe not a six pack. <laughs> okay. How about this? Maybe I will not have this backpack. Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. I would love that. We will, we will see it and we'll see it live at Habitat. <laughs> Super, super. Beautiful. So, so this is my favorite segment. Okay. okay. I call this as like a Dr. Pal segment. Rapid water. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because our hormones need water, not yeah. fire. Okay. okay. <laughs> Rapid water sounds like loose motion. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to gut feeling, Dr. Pal. <laughs> I never oh, realized right. that. <laughs> That's true. Gastroenterologist, it's okay. Of course. Sab kuch chalta hai. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. So the first thing is, okay, in this segment, what I do is I do research on the uh, guest. Okay. Okay. And I want to tell the audience that how much amount of time that you put in on your channel uh -huh. to give good content to the audience. Okay? okay. So I'm going to pick up some of the things that you've done in the past. Okay. okay. The first thing is you have put a video where how you spoke about if you are the brain of Hulk. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, it was such a cute video. We'll play that while we are talking about Amazing. it. I'm going to stream it a little bit. Uh, same thing. Okay. Did you see this? This is called Gutman on Air. Yes. Right? So Gutman is a new superhero that we are trying to create. Uh, create. Okay. And especially for kids. Yeah. And uh, similar to how you spoke from a brain of a Hulk, uh, what will you do if you are inside the brain of Dr. Pal, <laughs> the gut man? <laughs> so what are, what are his superpowers? So superpower is, uh, his, he will do anything to save the gut bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody is damaging the gut bacteria, he will go to the extent that he will pull the mobile phone out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, as a neuron, what will you say? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I would imagine uh -huh. that a gut man would have um, a lot of access to what is going on in the gut. Huh. Right? Huh. So, he might be having um, sort of x-ray vision. Huh. He has to because he has to know Correct. what uh, what is happening what in the gut. The stomach, yeah. right? So you won't need to do a CT scan. Ah. You won't need to do an MRI. Ah. You can directly see into the gut and understand what is going on. Yeah. You will have very microscopic vision. Ah. Right? Because you will need to know what each bacteria is also doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is a very crazy superpower. Right. Because you can actually tell the bacteria. Maybe you can even communicate with the bacteria. So at some level, your language centers are so evolved that you are able to understand what the bacteria are saying to each other and you're able to communicate with it. So you might be having different means of communication <laughs> with the bacteria. And um, I guess fourth would be you would have a very good persuasion power uh. because you'll have to convince people to change their diet and their <laughs> lifestyle, which is close to impossible. <laughs> so that would be our so fourth <laughs> superpower. That's why all the comments on my video says that for this, why are you living? <laughs> <laughs> you better die oh no <laughs> then you will do what every other superhero does which is try to save lives <laughs> save lives save lives what should be the mascot the mascot ah uh, you know like you know iron man has this big thing oh uh, the the, the uh, central the central thing yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, gutman no we don't have to go there no i don't <laughs> think we should i don't think we should but i'm glad that you and i and everybody listening would have imagined it imagine <laughs> Okay, super. Wonderful. Okay, you passed in flying color. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay, second. I know that you have a special trick to handle anxiety. Huh. Okay. Yes. And you call that as 54321 rule. Okay. Yeah. I want my audience to know that as well. So yes. I want you to do that for me because yeah. I'm anxious about this whole podcast thing. What will I do? Sure. So... One of the things in anxiety is that you have an out-of-body experience. Mm. You are not connected mm. anymore because your mind is always thinking about what will happen, right? So you're visualizing a future <clears throat> or you're anxious about something that has already happened. So you're visualizing the past, you're remembering the past and your mind is sort of driving itself up into more and more anxiety, just overthinking about it. One of the ways to bring your uh, consciousness back into the prefrontal cortex is to connect it to the present. Where are you now? Are you in danger now? Not in your imagination. In reality, are you in danger? So one of the ways to bring your body back to the present is through your senses. Right? So we can see, we can hear, we can touch, taste, smell. So there are five senses. Now, We'll start with five things that you can see. So just look around and name five things you can see. Okay, I'm going to say, okay, you have gone guts, yes. gut feeling with Dr. Pal, gut man on air, Sid warrior. Yes. And then camera. Camera. Ah. Now five things. You are literally constructing your reality because of anxiety, your reality is completely blurred. When you are very anxious, you won't even know where you are. Right? When you're having a panic attack, you are completely in a maze. It's like a... It's very hazy. Now, four things that you can touch. So, touching this. 
so far yes my jeans pan but feel the texture texture yeah you are able to you should be able to describe the texture i see okay soft velvety yes, yes. jeans pant is uh, thick yes and this is a plastic yeah. mug yeah. under stool wooden wooden right and you are able phone. to feel it yes uh, Plastic. So once you start feeling this and you focus on that sense, huh. you will find yourself more and more connected to your present moment. Then three things you can hear. Okay, so your voice. Yes. Fan. Yes. What else? <laughs> If you, that's the thing with hearing, uh-huh. that the more you listen, distant sounds will start becoming audible to you. Uh, wow! Wow! Eventually, you'll hear a clock ticking. Uh. You'll hear some distant. Traffic. Wow! You'll hear the rustling of the leaves. Leaves, huh? I was about to which say, which you would never have paid attention to, Correct. but you have to give it time. Wow! And then two things you can smell: the perfume, the yeah, uh, and then um, just the ambience of the room. Ambience smell. I can I can also smell a little bit of polish. Polish. I think uh, somewhere something must have been polished. Polished. Uh, and then one thing you can taste. So drink something. Yes. Uh, So while you do this, uh, by the time it's done, uh, you feel calm. Wow! Because now you are here uh, in this moment. Uh, you are not anxiously thinking about your exam tomorrow mm-hmm. or regretting about what you fought with your wife about. Uh, uh, you are in this moment. I see. Uh, And so now your prefrontal cortex has control. Control. Wow! So this is the five, four, three, two, one. Beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's our awesome. audience. Please, please make use of five, four, three, two, one. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. So the next one is I came to know from your videos is that you love chess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love chess as well. Okay. Uh, I was an under fourteen national second. Wow. In Cochin. That's amazing. Ha. Huh. And this was Lovely. under fourteen, and more than fourteen, my mom said that MBBS. Enough. Uh, <laughs> enough is enough. Which is a good thing. I'm so glad <laughs> she did that. Thank God I would not have been Axel. <laughs> I would not be in this position if my mom had not taken this. No, no. There, there's another an, another Chennai player who became world number yeah. one. So, <laughs> let's be only one. <laughs> okay. So you play chess, okay? Yes. So these are the five things that I always tell my patients. Okay. We talked about sleep, meditation, diet, exercise, and water. Hmm. Okay. Hydration. So and then we have five pieces in the. Yes, hmm. correct. So we have pawn, knight, bishop, rook, and queen. Hmm. And out of these five things that I tell you, which one you will choose to be the queen? I'll repeat the answer: hmm. sleep, meditation, diet, exercise, and water. And hmm. queen is the most powerful. Hmm. It has nine points, as you correct, know. Correct, correct, hmm. correct. So I would definitely say that sleep would be queen. Queen. That's a neurologist answer. Yeah. <laughs> Because no, no, I sleep, agree with that as well. Yeah, because sleep affects everything, everything. Mm. and you have good sleep, a lot of things become easier. Easier, mm. right? Um, Second is rook. Rook is five points. Rook is five points. Ah. I would say um, so. Here, diet, water, exercise—they're also connected, of mm. course. But um, meditation. I would say, yeah, meditation. Um, I think meditation would be uh, rook. the rook. Because meditation gives you like the the control, like the castles, ah. right? Like it, it, it. That also makes everything else easier. Absolutely. And Absolutely. um, ex exercise for me would be the pawns, like pawns. because multiple multiple moves. Um, you are they they form the they form the structure that Correct. gives you mm. you know going ahead. Mm. And um, knight. what are the two things? Uh, knight no. is uh, we have two more, which is uh, diet, diet and hydration. hydration uh. yeah hydration is very interesting um i would say that diet would be knight and mm. uh, hydration would be bishop bishop yeah um because again because of the range with which which yeah. <laughs> uh, it works uh, hydration is something that we kind of ignore uh. or i can i can actually switch uh. because i feel that knights are underrated Uh, oh, and uh, yeah, correct, correct, correct. correct. Knight is very powerful than bishop. Knight sometimes. is very powerful. Correct, with the folk. But knights are underrated, and uh, hydration is underrated. Ah. So I would say that knights are hydration, and uh, bishops would be diet. Uh, diet. Wow, yeah. beautiful. But one thing I really want to emphasize as neurologist, right? He is saying that sleep is the queen. Yeah, I ah, think so. So I also completely agree. Don't focus too much on your carb, protein, fat if you're not sleeping well. Correct. Mm. Also because. in order to sleep well which is regular time and fixed sleep and waking hours 
a lot of your other things have to get sorted. Correct. So if I meet somebody who sleeps and wakes up every day at the same time, I would automatically know that they have many other things sorted out. Beautiful. Beautiful. So I think that is why I think Queen is sleeping. beautiful. Yeah. Wonderfully placed. Wonderfully yeah. done. Okay. The third one is, um, I know that you talk about manifestation. Okay. So manifestation is, you know, you visualize something and it will happen. So that's what manifestation is. So if your manifestation works, what will you manifest for the change of society in the community from a neurological standpoint? Usually I wish this happens in my patients. Um, for my patients, <clears throat> actually for society, society as, a uh, whole, as a whole, I would, um, I would definitely want everyone to just know that their emotion and their plans for the future are coming from two different places. Because I feel that there is a lot of many people, most people in, in fact that I know, are in conflict because they think that sometimes I want this, sometimes I want that. Mm. Why can't I do this when I say I want that? Uh. But they don't understand that there are different parts of the brain uh. that have different priorities. Uh. So it's okay. You know, you don't have to struggle, struggle so much. To, uh, Just understanding that it's this conflict between your prefrontal and limbic that is causing all of this. It has brought me a lot of peace. Beautiful. So I would want everybody to feel that <laughs> peace of mind. So nice of you. I remember the ACC as well. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I know that your favorite book is Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy. And you've yeah. written a video as well. Yeah. And uh, if you are the last surviving man mm -hmm. and the alien abducts you to another planet, where you meet an another human, what neuro aspect would you ask him about the aliens? Wow. <laughs> um, I mean, that's what the book says. This is so interesting. I recently read this book called Three Body Problem. Huh. And there also, spoiler alert, if you haven't read it, then don't listen to the next two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> but there also they meet alien species. Uh -huh. And the difference is that the alien species can't lie. Wow. They can't lie. Huh. Because lying requires a sp specific brain skill. Is that right? Huh. Which is story creation. So you can just create a story when there is no story. Wow. Which is what lying is. Huh. So I will ask if are the aliens capable of lying? Lying. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's so deep. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I know that you write poems. Yes. Okay. So I know it's just a last minute request, but I want you to sing a poem or write, tell yeah. a poem yeah. to the audience on Circadian Rhythm. Wow. So I have um, today, like when I, I know that you texted in the morning and I thought, okay, I have to write something on, um, on gut. Uh, gut. So... What I actually wrote uh, was not about circadian rhythm, uh, but it was about brain gut axis. axis. Correct. I mean, that also is a part of circadian rhythm. Exactly. Uh -huh. Right. Because I thought that uh, it's so apt that Correct. you and I are sitting yeah. here <laughs> and there is a connection here. Right. Correct. So I've, um, people I've written don't know a, he's a brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just so that people yeah. know. He's the most important one. <laughs> so I'll, I'll read out to you. Uh, it's a small poem. Yes, please. The brain and the gut. Our long lost friends. One makes poop and the other makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> they both work hard. They both need rest. They're both tired of the crap that you ingest. <laughs> Absolutely true. They both want the love that they deserve. Uh -huh. They crib all day through the vagus nerve. <laughs> Whether it's food for thought uh. or thought for food, uh. you take care of one and the other feels good. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, wonderful, wonderful, Thank amazing, you. amazing. <laughs> such a such a pleasure talking to you. I, I didn't feel like a podcast at all. It was <laughs> just a casual chat. Yeah. And uh, so good. You know, the brain gut. Yeah. I think I felt like we have an access. I, I did too. <laughs> this was very, very nice. I'm so glad I was part of this. Something tells me that you be, this is not the first time. And uh, we will be so today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.